I'm sure you all know Zach Posen. He is a force in New York fashion. He launched his eponymous collection in 2002 after studying at Parsons and Central St. Martins in London. He has a unique vision for modern American glamour that marries couture technique with striking innovation. He received fashion's most prestigious honor, the CFDA's Perry Ellis Award for Women's Wear, just two years after launching his own line. His designs have been worn by everyone from First Lady Michelle Obama to celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow and Naomi Watts. And while we're used to seeing Zach's designs on the red carpet, we now get to see more of the man himself as the newest judge on Project Runway. And he's just signed on for a second season, so you're gonna see more of him. But you're gonna see more of him right now um, because he's here and he's going to share his story with us. So please welcome Zach Posen. Ah. Hi, Dan. Good morning, everybody. Okay, Zach, so we just gave you this fancy intro, but... I heard. <laughs> and it makes you sound like you're supposed to be this very old person because you've done so much, but you're not. No. <laughs> you're 32. So, t tell all these young people who, um, you know, want, aspire to be, you know, at some point where, where you are, how did you get started? Wow. Um, well, I think the best place to start is... Um, by making clothing, by taking fabric, rolling it on a floor. Rugs are really good for it because the fabric stays flat and, and just taking scissors and cutting into it. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, my love for what I do started from film, from um, drawing. I mean, I think that you have to be incredibly driven and uh, prolific and a little bit wasteful to create and uh, you know that's sort of the process but uh, you know I started making clothing for my sister I remember her making a tie skirt where you sew all the ties in uh, sort of segments and then I took like a, a sewing class when I was about six where I made like an apron with a duck on it and, uh, you know, I always, uh, I don't know, I always worked with my hands. I think that I had an advantage that my father is an artist and a creator, and so I always sort of was watching a creative process. But, um, you know, you find your own rhythm in how to do it. I think that to make it uh, as a designer in fashion, one needs uh, to be incredibly driven, patient. I don't know if I was so patient, but I, I would suggest patience. Patience is a virtue. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, when I was about 16, I had to sort of, you know, get a summer job, and I started interning very young at uh, designer Nicole Miller. And she had me sketching, and I saw how the workroom worked. And at that time, I don't know, sort of, if anybody remembers, she was really famous for these printed ties. And so, obviously, it was sort of pre-Adobe and Photoshop, so it was all hand-painted, and I was sort of stationed in the color Xerox room. So there was lots of, you know, body art, <laughs> Xerox art lying on the tables. Displaying. <laughs> um, you know, and then the next summer, you know, I worked at a company as an intern, Toka, and then I started interning and getting as much experience as possible at the Metropolitan Museum in the costume collection. One day, uh, I walked down there and I heard a voice that sounded like Vincent Price. And there was an exhibition called The Four Seasons. And I started just asking questions. I was sort of amongst a sea of uh, elderly women. I started raising my hand a lot. I really disagreed with, with the person who was giving the tour. And, uh, it turned out to be the curator at the time, Richard Martin, and he said, would you want to intern here? So about a month later, I wrote my letter, and I, they said, come in for an interview. I still hadn't told them that I was 16. <laughs> and I mean, I must have looked 13. <laughs> uh, I had braces and wore crazy outfits. But uh, I went in, and they brought me into a room, and it was Diana Vreeland's office and it was intact at the time. 
And I spun in the chair and I was so nervous and I sang Think Pink. For <laughs> You sang that? I sang Think Pink. I spun in you know, the 60s chair with the Peacocks and the Nijinsky and the Nuryoff photos all over the walls. Amazing. This Anyhow, is how to nail an in. Yeah, you nail you know, and uh, it was an incredible, incredible experience. And that's, you know, there was a community of other interns there that were making clothing. And we made the wigs for the next exhibition, which was called Wardrobe. So we were making uh, wigs, you know, of different uh, time periods out of newsprint, out of yellow pages, and then I was working filing, uh, you know, before internet, into the cabinets of sort of, you know, every piece of fashion that would come into the museum, uh, you know, in written history, and then people would come in to research. So I was not only working with amazing fashion historians, but it was also, and and restoration people, you know, where they sort of dip these ancient artifacts into like weird vats of weird liquids. Very strange, and you've sort of Christy Turlington naked in hallways of the mannequins, which were based on her. Um, but, uh, you know, you have amazing designers at the time that were going in. So while I was there, you know, I got to see, uh, you know, Alexander McQueen came in. Uh, the late Alexander McQueen, who, you know, was probably one of my heroes. It was an exciting time in fashion. You know, it was the beginning, uh, you know, of, of really uh, Alexander McQueen being important in fashion, uh, and John Galliano was sort of at the height. Uh, to believe it, Olivier Teskin was starting then as well. And it was just a very exciting, formative time in New York. Uh, was a very exciting time to live in. And, you know, I think I was making clothing for myself and my girlfriends, and that's how it started. I really suggest if you're a woman, especially, and you're interested in, in fashion, make your own clothing you're wearing. Have that dialogue with the world, because that's how you learn, sorry. That's how you learn, uh, you know, what works, what feels right, and what you want to say. But, and this is all, you're still like in high school at this point, so. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was in high school, you know, I was dressing crazy, making really ugly things. I had this. So when you say that, what were you wearing? I wore these really heinous John Fluvog platform, like uh, Kermit green shoes that I like, saved up to get. And I wore these antique, uh, like 1930s sailor trousers. And then I'd usually wear like some mesh shirt and I would wear ivy in my hair and then <laughs> fedora feathers, you know, that go in a hat. I'd pin them into my hair to sort of hold my Jufro in place. <laughs> I, I wish we could just like flash a photo. And you know, it was my dialogue with New York. I took the subway to high school every day. And uh, you know, I think that my high school was really formative too. I went to school with this amazing group of people and ladies. I went to an incredible high school. It was incredibly formative. I really wasn't academic before I got to that school and I had never found my group of people at school and uh, it was incredible. I mean, you know, my first day there was this little girl with white blonde hair and a leopard leotard with jewelry around and she was like 12 or 13, you know, and I looked at this little creature you know, and uh, she was a professional actress, and her of name course. was Paz de la Huerta, and she was this little creature, and then, uh, you know, I, I dressed as Charlie Chaplin to my first day of school. I was so nervous and had a bowler hat, and uh, it was just an amazing, you know, I went to school with this great model uh, named Marina Hamner, who was huge at the time, and sort of starring in all the Italian Vogue shoots with Ellen Von Unworth, and, uh, it was also uh, the time of uh, sort of, of David Sorrenti and all these girls were sort of part of that world and so they had sort of entered into fashion already and I met uh, my best friend who is also a daughter of an artist uh, named Lola Schnabel and her mom had brought Azadine Aliyah to New York and so she had this basement filled with the most incredible pieces in the world that she just wanted to get rid of at the time, if we only knew. 
you know, she was probably traumatized by having so much of this amazing clothing at the time, but she just wanted to get rid of it. And I remember going through it and just being blown away by it. And at the same time, I was at the Met after school researching heavily the work of Madeleine Vianney and falling in love with that and this kind of feminine empowerment through glamour. I don't know, it all became pretty formative and then I moved to London. I had to, I moved to London and um, sort of immersed myself into the culture there. And so we're talking about Central St. Martin's. Yeah, sorry, I went to Central St. Martin's. St. Anne's in Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn, that. sorry, I went to school in Brooklyn. Uh, and, uh, and then I went to school in London and that was a huge choice. Uh, I applied, I skipped the foundation year, which was, I think, a mistake. I mean, I don't regret anything in life. I think don't live with any regrets. That's some advice I would give. But, uh, you know, I immerse myself there. And, you know, I've always um, been inspired by women and finding, uh, you know, great different muses of different ages, of different races, of different body types. And I don't know, when I was there, you know, it was, you know, that's sort of high uh, vintage culture. So I don't know, when you think of London, you have rock culture, you have 60s culture, you have aristocrat culture, and that whole mix. And, you know, in, in the vibe of the clothing I was working at, I immersed myself into the work of Ozzy Clark, who was pretty much forgotten at that point, or Jean Muir. And it was very formative. And uh, I lived in, uh, I moved, I first moved with a girl, uh, who I met in a nightclub in New York, you know, who I thought had like the it factor. You know, it's always finding those girls that, that have that magic quality, or women. And uh, so she became my fit model, and that girl's name was Jessica Jaffe. Uh, you know, I thought, wow, I have like my redhead beauty, my ice queen. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so I was fitting all my clothing on her, and then I uh -huh. moved out and lived, moved to West London, and met uh, at, out at night a girl named Poppy de Villeneuve and her sister Daisy and this girl Iris Palmer. I was in love with this girl Iris Palmer. That's why I moved there. Uh, she was this amazing creature and I just wanted to see this, this world of sort of West London and haberdashery. That's how I described the house. It was sort of Charles Dickens, the haberdashery. Sounds and incredible. You know, it was just, it was happening. It was at that moment in mm -hmm. London when it was happening and um, you know, I remember my second year there, I got cast on the street uh, to be in an American Vogue shoot. And it was Here Mario Testino, and they were shooting in the living room that I was living on the couch in, which was really, <laughs> you know, it was cool looking, but it was really dirty. And, I could, and, it was, and they were sort of uh, fudging that it was uh, Lizzie Jagger's home. And so I was in a party scene, and so, you know, that was the first time I met Camilla Nickerson and saw her on set doing a shoot. And, you know, you just try to immerse yourself. I worked for a designer, Robert Carey Williams there, whose whole thing was about cutting up and deconstructing clothing there. Uh, you know, and he would take these giant scissors and start chopping them. These beautiful pieces of clothing, incredibly tailored. He was famous because he um, took machetes to t-shirts which is sort of bizarre and illegal in the UK because you can't really have a gun in the UK, but we were really far, far, far out of central London. So, so, so it was okay. It was okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then um, sort of a few years, a year later, uh, I was at a Christmas party and uh, my high school buddy, Poth, was going to it and I was working on a dress in school. And school was really challenging. They were really hard. I had an amazing mentor at the school named Howard uh, Tange, who actually there's a book coming out on him. And uh, I w if there's, a, uh, there's uh, a Kickstarter to make this book happen, he's an incredible professor. He's, you know, he was the professor of a lot of really amazing designers who you all know that went to Central St. Martin's. And he was really hard on me. And the school was incredibly competitive. I was really young, much younger than anybody else that was in the school with me. But what a wow experience. It was, you know, way out there. And they thought I was really commercial. And, uh, you know, they, 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 you know, they pushed uh, my buttons. Yeah. And it was a good dialogue and what great educators do. Yeah, so when you say that 
he was really hard on you. What is what well, does that almost mean? everybody fails every every single project at Central St. Martin's. You just fail, your grades are posted in the hall and they're left there through your entire <laughs> three years that you're at school there and it is cutthroat. You cannot leave your clothing or anything you're working on to go to the bathroom. You can't leave it in your locker. Uh, it will disappear. You it, just... It, yeah, you take it home with you, otherwise it's cut up. Okay. Uh, you know, so it was sort of really good no prep, joke. and and there were people who had gotten master degrees and then would re-enter this program to like launch their career. So you know, the standards were high, and I was starting to get attention. I remember, you know, there was like a party photo of me looking like some, you know, I don't know what we'd call it, like emo nymph. Now, <laughs> I don't know what the look was at the time that I was going for, but it was something like that. I love and, emo nymph. Uh, I think you should revive better than it. sea punk. Yeah. I like sea punk too, but <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, and uh, so, I, a girl wore a dress. This girl who I went to high school, Poth, wore a dress of mine to a party, and a week later, I got a call out of the blue and said, "We want to write a piece about this dress that we saw at this party." And you know, that was a very formative decision making time because I, you know, it's the New York Times. It was really a big deal and who knew what this would lead to or how it would come out and be formative. And at that point, I really just wanted, uh, you know, to work for designers. That's sort of the normal pathway that you work. And uh, at the same time, uh, the great Naomi Campbell had seen pieces I had made and uh, wanted to order some, so she came to my little basement apartment in Bloomsbury on Mecklenburg Square. I remember these amazing legs <laughs> walking down these stairs, and there was a bag that said NC on it, and uh, she had her perfume in the bag that she gave as a gift, and then a book uh, about Nelson Mandela. And we started doing fittings, and she taught me everything about fittings. And she has, you know, one of the most spectacular bodies for fit in the world. Her body can scale up and down. We do things in fashion called grading. But she knew all the tricks and she was really nurturing. So this girl wore this dress at the party and it was all sort of at the same time. And about three or four months later, in the fashion of the times, an article came out by a writer, Daisy Garnett, uh, called A Star is Born. And I said, the best dress of a catwalk wasn't on a runway. This is whipped up by a genius in training. And it went on. And from <laughs> there, it was, OK, somebody, I need to find somebody in fashion communication and promotion at my school. And you know, I sort of had my little odd gang of people I'd collected. And I was making t-shirts and selling them at a store. First, I tried to sell to a store called Pinulai. And there was this new uh, fashion uh, buyer there uh, who ended up to become the stylist of Lady Gaga uh, years later uh, and uh, they didn't buy them. They wouldn't take them because I wouldn't give them to them on consignment. But that's probably was probably really normal and par for the course. So then I took them to another store uh, called Cook and Tozai and they started selling them and then uh, more press happened, and I was just doing it out of my room, and I came back for a summer, and buyers were interested. Uh, then uh, Henry Bendels wanted to, uh, to buy, and I didn't really, ha they were sort of the leftover remnants of these one-of-a-kind pieces that I was making and sort of getting extra cash to live in London, because, you know, my parents thought I was crazy. They thought I was on drugs. <laughs> but in London, it's so expensive with the exchange rate. It was like cheap fabric and coffee and books. I was cutting up a lot of books at the time, uh, making collages. And, uh, you know, at that point, yeah, it sort of had built. I don't know. There was this idea that there was a brand there when there absolutely was not. Uh, like fashion TV came and filmed like a photo shoot mm -hmm. and so I gathered all the girls that I'd been making custom pieces for and did that and uh, I came back and Henry Bendel's uh, you know wanted to buy and I couldn't sell them the pieces so I said let me sketch a collection and is there any way that you could maybe help finance that because at that point uh, my father's an artist and, you know, it's very, you know, his dedication is to his work. He's not a salesman. I think I'm probably a reaction 
to him in a way, and my sister, they're all artists. And my mom, sort of in reaction to that in a different way, had become, uh, changed her life early in her mid midlife in her career and became a businesswoman. So I had these like polar opposites. She became this like power woman and amazing, even though, you know, she's like, wants to be throwing clay pots probably and being, you know, you know, in her, in her garden uh, anyhow. So uh, then 9-11 happened and I, 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 my parents moved to Spring Street in, uh, in the early 70s and bought their loft and it was a really scary time in New York and I thought, what am I doing? My, me and my family thought, what are we doing making fashion? This is so, una clothing is so unimportant right now and uh, you know it was very scary and then you know they called Henry Bendel's called back a week or two later and said are you ready let's see the sketches so I went up there and they bought them and they were very generous a guy Ed Burstell who is the fashion director came and it was consecutive first a junior buyer then a mid buyer then the senior buyer anyhow uh, long story short they bought the collection and then I got contacted by Gen Art, and we did our first show there. And then the, you know, the second, then I did my first, in February, I did my first uh, full show. You know, and you get sort of help from friends and people, uh, you know, that were interesting. I had uh, an amazing, I think the show was hypnotized. Besides that, I had amazing supermodel girlfriends at that time. And, and people, you know, I think at the time, uh, you know, I believe in people. I don't know. You know, fashion is so fast and fickle. You know, one moment a model is the face of the moment. They're not next. You know, I had always seen the great model Karen Elson, who I'd met at 16 working at Nicole Miller, uh, you know, sort of as the starlet. But I think she had been seen sort of as more of a, you know, a very a weird looking model. So we sort of opened that show with her looking very glamorous and you know I think it sort of revived her many revivals of her of her illustrious incredible career she's had. So what did it feel like you said you know all of a sudden the press had decided you were a star with a brand and you were like I'm just in my basement. It was so, so pure. What did it feel like? I mean I hate this word but my family and I you know it was so artsy fartsy. <laughs> at the time, it's a word I really don't like, but it was, and you know, I did it in uh, the Angel Orenson Center, and uh, asked my friend at the time, John Frusciante from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, to compose music for the show, which was very Amazing. hypnotic. <laughs> and uh, you know, you found a person who wanted to help with PR and invite some people, and everybody came. They all came, and. Uh, it was very overwhelming and way over the top. I remember, uh, you know, Susie Menkez making like Saint Laurent references, and you know, you just get thrown into it. It was like go. Yeah. It was go time, and that was it. And, and you're how old at this point? I'm 21. At the point, it was go time. Uh, you know, Interview Magazine was shooting all the girls on a brick wall in the basement there, like one after the next, to publish like in full pages. And uh, Miss Wintour came, uh, who I had not met yet. What was that like? Well, I didn't meet her until, I think, uh, the next show. That was my first preview with her, once I got official PR uh, representation, who could actually like bring me to Vogue. Before that, I would just bring my bag to the front door. Somebody would bring it in, they'd bring it back. Right, you Probably go still in. carrying like a VHS tape of the show and uh, you know I don't know I'm gonna you know like Yiddish words you have to have chutzpah I don't know you have to be brave uh, you have to uh, go for it I think I also played the role you know I think that since I was sort of a teenager and sort of thrown into this world of sort of very young fabulous people you appropriate the role of that and so you know, in a weird way, I think fashion is a is a vampire industry. They like youth, they like new, mm -hmm. and they like to suck. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, they see me as some kind of little prince character or idea, so let's be that. And it sort of created this idea and myth. 
And you know, if they smelled that there was an idea that there was some kind of uh, financing or money behind this, then people would believe it. So I just played it. You just sort of winged it and played it and um, I don't know, that sort of, you know, from there then um, a really amazing PR company called KCD took me on pro bono. And, uh, you know, and then it became very systematic. All of a sudden my friends sort of were out, became like the stylist, the first stylist, professional stylist. First I had always worked with my friend Stella as my stylist and my friends casting the shows and then all of a sudden I had a professional casting director and incredibly large production around me and it was very overwhelming. Uh, I'd started my company in my parents' living room and I say we started our company on Aaron interns because we, I mean, I didn't, me and my mother and sister, you know, I don't know, I was living on probably like 20 bucks a week. It was crazy, living on my couch in my living room. Then we moved to a studio. We were getting like sponsorship basically to pay for the shows. You know, it was, it was, everything was about putting on that show. That's how a lot of young designers exist, especially in London. That's the existence and the routine uh, that it works, but, uh, yeah, from there, you know, you get thrown into my first stylist was Lori Goldstein, who was incredibly good first stylist. nurturing at the time and was kooky, you know, and it was, you know, it was just very surreal. And then you were sort of on center stage. And I think at that point, you know, I have to say that, you know, I have a love for theater and for film and theatrics. And so the performance aspect of it was something that I could, uh, was in my comfort zone there to perform in that way. And so, you know, I think probably drove some people in fashion who didn't understand how this happened, drove them nuts. You know, it probably annoyed a lot of people. I'm sure it was a pain in the ass. I'm sure I was really over the top for people at the time. I'm still probably am. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I don't know, it, it happened. We had our second show and, and it started to build and then re more and more retailers were interested and started to pick it up. And then, um, you know, on a red carpet one day, uh, I saw Puff Daddy and I said, do you want to do music for a show? And he came down to the studio and he couldn't believe that we were such a small business with such a large presence or brand recognition or name and uh, he wanted to help. And at that point, you know, I had been, uh, Sung, I, I had sung and danced, you know, for all the powers that be at all the luxury companies. I'd been offered a lot of wild brands, and uh, you know, I'd flown to Milan to meet with the Versace, with Donatella. Um, you know, I'd been in France, you know, and taken to you know a lot of different luxury brands, and you know, you sort of take it seriously at this point, but it's so absurd when I think back at it and how young I was in that situation. But, you know, I'm glad that it didn't happen. I think it would have been a really big mistake. And I, I you know, that's something I can't, I, you know, I, I, I'm very relieved that, that sort of that path didn't happen for me mm -hmm. at that age because those are machines. Yeah, yeah. And especially, you know, you can see what we've seen with a lot of designers who've been turned through those houses, it, it can break a person down. It's a lot of work. This is, uh, this is, you know, I think Karl Lagerfeld said, you know, this is a sport in a way. You have to be a triathlon runner. I mean, I don't stop. I take a max, a max of like two weeks a year off. Right. That's it. I mean, I'm going, I go every weekend. Uh, anyhow, so. You know, that's how it builds it. And then, you know, from Sean, who, who sort of initially entered my company, his investors uh, took it over. And then I sort of got, uh, learned the world of venture capitalism, <laughs> which uh, was new and interesting. And that was the beginning of my MBA. Knowing my that? margins. And I learned through many years the balance and trial and error, the respect of art and commerce, because Fashion uh, is a balance of that. This is why it's not a fine art. You know, fine art now has sort of adopted a fashion schedule and a system where artists have to show. But at the end of the yeah. day, a painting is about a, an expression. It's about the process, you know. 
and uh, you know, it's not a decorative art form, and it's not uh, an art form that is about function. Fashion is about function. Right. It's got to sell. You have to sell. It's about fantasy. It's it's all these elements, but it is on a schedule. Right. And uh, after my second show. Uh, I did my first trunk show. I got flown to San Francisco by a guy who was like a marketing director who I'd never met uh, in Neiman's. Maybe he was the PR director at the time. And I met him and his name was Ken Downing. And uh, he became a mentor of mine and I learned and saw America through him. I did, I did San Francisco and we had like 3,000 people show up and the mayor of San Francisco showed up and it was really quite overwhelming and amazing and it was sort of just like every day was over the top in this way uh -huh. and uh, I don't know and then I did Dallas. Welcome to Texas. That's and an I got there and on the stuff. first day on, on the, I, went, I was staying at a hotel called the Mansion at Turtle Creek and the first day there, there were these uh, cowboy boots. That, and a note that said, welcome to Texas. And they had a ZP on them, I still have them. They're from Lucchese, which is a very, really beautiful boot maker. And uh, I remember I walked down and it was filled. And the women were like these incredible creatures, self-created creatures, dressed amazing, hair amazing. And uh, you know, it was sort of, I, I didn't ever grow up with seeing this kind of wealth or fabulousness. I mean, fashion, we think it's, it is amazing and, and this world is, is glamorous, but it's nothing like the customer. The customer is the ultimate muse. And I remember I walked down and the first person I met, she walked up to me and she had this huge ring that she obviously wanted to show me. <laughs> and she goes, the water in my cellar is this high. Is <laughs> showing it to me to sort of show the ring, and uh, you know that was the beginning of uh, of you know my love affair with America and learning it because I'm just a, I'm a city kid. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your design process too, and how it's evolved. And you know, you guys, you work right here in yeah. New York, and you're known for these incredible techniques. So. Well, that's all. That's been you know up until this point. You know, my whole career has been uh, to cultivate a studio in New York. When I came back to New York, it was very clear to me that, you know, American fashion uh, and America is about speed, process, and delivery, and sell through, and it, it's a, it is uh, about sportswear or social dressing. And I just didn't fit into either of those. I really, just in my heart of heart, I don't know, I felt a little, I felt American. Felt London, you know. I loved a lot of uh, international designers, and uh, so I sort of had to find my own rhythm. And it was really important for me to cultivate and nurture craft in America. And so I set up an atelier, which at the time everybody was getting rid of their studios, and I created it as a laboratory and as a school in a way. I thought I need to teach a younger. It was so hard to find people that could sew and could pattern make and understood the process of artisanal making samples or clothing. And so it became a major labor of love. It's, it's something that I uh, nurture and will fight for to keep that studio. It's a magical, beautiful place. So I have an atelier and we cut and we sew and we invent techniques from the inspiration. I start off with colors each season way, way, way in advance than fabrics. Then I start to put inspiration boards, and I, I always say that I try to be like a giant cultural receive dish, and high to low, you know, and what comes in because I think it's important to understand subculture, mass culture, high culture, snob culture, all those things that come in to be uh, things so that you can balance, you know, something subversive. Subversive is attitude to me, so you know that that's that's what makes something cool is how you feel in a piece of clothing. But in the studio, I, uh, you know, we create, we imaginate. I don't know, you know, I thought if I wasn't a fashion designer, I would have wanted to work for the Disney company as an Imagineer. That was like the Pretty other cool dream job, like drawing or thinking about experience and journey. 
and thinking about all the senses. So uh, yeah, so in the studio uh, we create and it's changed over the years. You know, I've pushed that studio to the brink of deep exhaustion, you know, when the standards were so high and the expectations of fashion were so high and you had different stylists that you needed, you know, 800 samples to do a show and, you know, who would have known to say no? Not right. Not, not, a business, good, not a good business decision, not a good creative decision, trust your vision. But over the years, uh, you know, with many people that have learned, I mean, I've put so many young people out there in the industry that have come through my office, uh, you know, that run all of the sort of designers in New York now and are on major roles and teams, uh, all of the ones that you guys love. They all, they all either came through my studio or... <laughs> or work through it and uh, you know I hope that they'll always have that respect for uh, handwork mm -hmm. and that visceral amazing thing which is uh, eternal and timeless of making something and expressing it with your hands and with your mind and your emotion mm -hmm. and hopefully hopefully uh, promoting uh, women and women having amazing experiences and having confidence and, and glamour Glamour, mm. above all. Um, we're, we're sort of like winding down. Sorry, I talk a lot. <laughs> That's, you're the perfect Sorry. Guest. That's the point. Um, so I just wanted to ask um, for everyone here, when you, you know, you've obviously had tremendous success, but when you come up against struggles or challenges, what have those been for you and how do you overcome them? Um. Very challenging, different times. Uh, you learn over time with maturity. You have to be so resilient in fashion. Um, as a judge on Project Runway. Yes. That was one of my questions uh, as I saw well. it, so Let's I'm gonna bring them in. into one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have to be resilient. This is not, uh, nobody's gonna feel bad for you. Yeah. They're just not. This is, this is uh, because it's so fast paced, we're all tired all the time. Fashion people, you know, it, it's, it's just how it is. So you gotta be resilient. You gotta pick yourself up and go. I remember my first, uh, you know, Kill Piece by Kathy Horn. And I was so young and it was supposed to be this big profile. Uh, and the name of the article was like so adorable. And she'd had me, they, they had had me like go to Alex Katz, the artist's studio to be doing like portraitures and like paintings of me. So it was like all this hype. And it was, you know, maybe she thought it was really good and maybe retrospectively it was good, but it wasn't valuing what I valued, which was mm -hmm. my work and my craft at the time. Right. Retrospectively, it's okay because it pushed me. Yeah. You have to see all those hurdles as growth opportunities, as ways to make you a stronger individual and as a creator. I think that, uh, as a designer, as somebody working in fashion, you have to be on point. This is such a competitive industry. Uh, you have to be resilient, as I said. You have to put your best uh, foot and face forward. Uh, every day there are gonna be challenges and you learn from them and you grow from them and um, you have to be uh, strategically and smartly uh, aware and keep your eyes open. I think as a creator, for any of you uh, ladies and gentlemen, keep your eyes open. Don't feel jaded. Don't follow rules because to create something new you have to break the rules in some way or another. You have to surprise people. Uh, you have to pioneer. That's at least, I mean if you want to make a quick buck fast, that's not hard in the world. If you want to create, you know, I see that I, I feel like I've just begun. Every, you know, and I feel that way every day. Every day has its challenges and I've just begun and it's just the beginning. And being a creator uh, is not a, there's no instantaneous gratification because as soon, if you get instantaneous gratification, the harder the fall. Mm -hmm. And then the harder it's gonna be to learn that pickup, but it does make you strong. Mm -hmm. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be able to, and you have to be your best talking point. You know, I don't think we're living in a time where anymore where the idea of the reclusive designer 
uh, is uh, really has potential success. We're living in a time when people, when you need to have a face to right. the brand and have depth behind that. And I actually, when I think about designers that have had the staying power, uh, alive and not alive, those are big characters. Yeah. And even, and the American ones too, Calvin is like totally eccentric. Donna, Donna's Donna. Donna is Donna. And uh, you know, these are big characters and they're people that are like driven. We are, you know, we, it's, you have to be uh, a creative, uh, hopefully beautiful warrior yeah. in that way. Instead it's really, uh, you know, and, and I think you have to learn how to collaborate. That's the other point. I think collaboration, collaboration is king. And you have to learn how to trust your team. I certainly did. There were times, you know, when you have so many voices, you start to question stuff mm -hmm. and you start to learn how to trust your team and the people you work around. And that is so valuable. And when you have that, then every day is like a dream and uh, you know, even with the challenges, you're all working together. Uh, and if you aren't business savvy, find your friend that is. Find your, find your smart friend that is and understand that dialogue. You know, I mean, it is a, a, a pairing, even though I feel like I have a good understanding of how the business side of fashion works. It took me many people and lots of time to finally find uh, the right partner. And when I did, I knew that that was the person. And uh, you know, it's been an incredible, I don't know, over now almost over three year uh, journey with that person. And there's a huge amount of trust. And uh, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's what I would say. I would say wear your clothing that you make Make it strong, make it bold. Uh, start seeing how people react. Then somebody on the streets is gonna say, I like that. And you say, I'm gonna make that for you. I'll make it for you. How, you know, either, you know, if they look amazing, make it to them if you can for free, because graciousness is really important. And generosity is gonna really get you far in life, I believe. Um, and, uh, and then if they wanna buy it, even better. And, and start that dialogue. And then it's word of mouth. It's like guerrilla marketing. There's no, it's not, uh, you know, there's different ways that people have made it. Some people, young people start and have their sort of whole base established and have like, you know, the sales force, the PR force. And I think that's amazing. But I think there's something also really, uh, in terms of building something for long term and long for the rest of your life, to learn it yourself. Yeah. Any are there any questions? Sorry. <laughs> Giving <laughs> We're gonna do two. Two. Yeah, just stand up. Just stand up, I can hear. Maybe. <laughs> uh, what's your best advice in building your team? Trial and error. <laughs> There's no I think um, people that you like to be around, people that share a similar vision, people that bring a different skill set. That, then that you can offer. You don't need double ups. I think that's important in building a team. Um, and clear communication. Even if you have somebody really talented and, and then the communication isn't there, that's not gonna work. You, always, you know it has to have that ease of, of dialogue to it. That's, that's you know, and, and trust. Team is trust. The process, well, I think there's a few things that I've learned. I used to do collections. I mean, if you go on to style.com and stuff, like every season was a reinvention and it was so extreme. Uh, and, um, you know, now it becomes, um, it's more, I, I was like, slow down. Fast fashion is already out there. You know, to me, sportswear and fast fashion and trend fashion, that's there. We'll supply the ideas as designers and as creative people for that. Who cares? Coffee is great. But I do think that uh, repetition is reputation. And I think that it's really important uh, to have that build in the process 
and uh, stay true to your vision, that's the key. Uh, the ideas come. I get inspired every minute. I don't know, you should all follow my Instagram. I'm constantly posting my process. I'm continuously posting things that inspire me. It can be from a book, it can be from watching uh, TV, from how those flowers are arranged and that really nice yellow color next to that pink that on its own looks sort of bland and then next to that pops. Um, you it's know, happening. it's it's oh, it's small things. It's continuous inspiration. It's it is the people around you, and I think the key to it is keeping your eyes open. Don't be jaded. There's no reason if you're going to be in fashion, please bring joy to the world and bring joy to the women that you wear to because that's a very powerful thing that you you have the opportunity to do. Yeah, that that's that was good. Thank you. Okay, guys. Everyone, thank you. Please, please thank Zach for his. Of time. Thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna walk off with you I this love way. That. We're making it. Cool. You guys have a busy day today.